Welcome to the Water Resources Podcast. I'm your host, Bridget Scanlon, from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. This podcast is produced in partnership with the National Academy of Engineering. In this podcast, we discuss water challenges with leading experts. Welcome to the Water Resources Podcast. I'm delighted to welcome Jude Cobbing uh, to the podcast today. Uh, Jude is currently an advisor on integrated water resources management at Save the Children, which is about a hundred year old charity organization. Um, Jude, would you like to describe a little bit about your background uh, related to water resources? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Bridget. And it's really lovely to be on your podcast and, and, and hello to all of your listeners. So I'm, I'm, as you say, I work for Save the Children uh, at present here in Washington, D.C. In, in the United States. But I'm a groundwater scientist by background, a hydrogeologist, and I, I uh, studied hydrogeology in, in the UK and worked for the British Geological Survey for five years, followed by more than 10 years uh, back in Southern Africa uh, in, in a variety of roles there for the, the public sector, the private sector, and working in mining and engineering and rural water supply as well, which is my one of my first, you know, my first interests. And I've been in the States since 2015. I did some work for the World Bank, working on uh, African water resources, particularly groundwater availability and some of the applications of groundwater to questions of economic growth and development and food security in Africa. And to bring us right up to date, I've been with Save the Children for the last two and a half years, uh, working as an advisor on a whole range of USAID funded development projects. Thank you so much, Jude, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, one of the things that got me interested about interviewing Jude was his article titled um, Waking a Sleeping Giant, Realizing the Potential of Groundwater in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, today I hope we will cover a number of different issues, including the role of groundwater in poverty alleviation, uh, importance in irrigated agriculture, and the reasons why groundwater has not been developed that much in sub-Saharan Africa and how we can develop solutions to enhance groundwater development to improve um, uh, food security, water security, and increase uh, climate resilience there. So that's quite a slew of things that I hope we can cover today, uh, Jude. Uh, so maybe a first start with uh, what motivated you uh, to write the article titled Waking the Sleeping Giant? and also your more recent paper on uh, groundwater and the discourse of um, uh, shortage in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, thanks, Bridget. So those two publications really came out of work that I was doing at the World Bank uh, as a groundwater advisor. And we were, we were looking closely at groundwater availability in Africa, south of the Sahara mainly, and its applications for things like irrigation uh, and food security. And I became increasingly uh, a little concerned by the, 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 it seemed to me there were a lot of articles out there talking about a global groundwater shortage and a global groundwater crisis. And it seemed to me that they drew mainly from countries in the Northern Hemisphere in the United States, in South Asia, uh, in, in China, where there, where there are very legitimate problems of groundwater overdraft. Uh, however, in, in, in across most of Africa, uh, we, we use very little of the groundwater resource at the moment. And my concern was that this discourse of global shortage was being applied to Africa and was actually having the unintended effect of stalling investment and interest in groundwater and, and, and farmer-led groundwater ir irrigation. And I saw that as a, and do see that as a serious problem. And, and that was the motivation for the articles. Yeah, I really enjoyed those articles, Jude. And I thought it was very refreshing to hear that viewpoint because we don't hear it very often these days. And most of the uh, emphasis is on shortage and scarcity and things like that. And I think uh, 
that aspect was also emphasized in the recent World Bank report, uh, the hidden wealth of nations and the role of groundwater, indicating that uh, groundwater was being underutilized in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so after talking with you recently, um, you got me to thinking about looking at poverty and, and the role of groundwater in alleviating poverty. So I was looking at the multidimensional poverty index that's uh, developed by the UN and Oxford, and uh, they consider living standards, education and health when they develop this indi indicator. Um, and we know that water cross cuts a lot of those themes, uh, uh, living standards with uh, water security and also uh, health in terms of nutrition and food security. And then education, I think, in people having to walk long distances to get water and, and not being able to go to school and things like that. So. Um, what I found interesting about their statistics was they looked at about 110 countries globally, that's 6.1 out of 8 billion people, and they said 1.1 billion of those 6.1 was uh, considered acutely multidimensionally uh, poor, uh, that's 18% of their population that they looked at, and half of those poor people live in sub-Saharan Africa, so that's a huge issue. And because you work for Save the Children, 50% are children, not because you work for Save the Children, but that's an interesting statistic also. But the other aspect uh, that I gleaned from our conversation recently was you said that um, water resources and irrigation play a very big role in getting countries out of poverty. And they mentioned that 25 of the 41 countries halved their multidimensional poverty index within the past 15 years including China and India. And so because we mostly focus on overexploitation and water scarcity and things, uh, we tend to ignore the benefits of uh, de water development and how it can improve uh, society. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, Jude. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Um, I think you put your finger on it. There is there is a crisis in, in, in Africa, and it is a crisis of of underdevelopment and of poverty. And we you've mentioned the multidimensional poverty index. We know that uh, poverty at the moment is an immensely serious problem in many African countries. We, 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 according to World Bank data by 2050, we think that around nine out of 10 of the world's poorest people will live in Africa. So, uh, the, the crisis, as as I see it, uh, is is very much one of, of of poverty and underdevelopment and and lack of, of access to resources, and irrigation and and groundwater have a huge role to play there uh, in in making agriculture more productive and in making agriculture climate resilient. It's uh, with one or two exceptions, nearly every single country in Africa is using only a small fraction of its renewable groundwater resource, less than 5%. With, as I say, there's a couple of, of, of exceptions, and one of them is South Africa. We can talk about that a bit later on. But essentially, we have a continent that desperately needs to use uh, more of its water for irrigation, for food security, for climate resilience, for, for economic development and growth, and for lifting people, and particularly children, as you say, out of poverty. And yet we're not doing that. And so I think, uh, you know, this is not a simple question. Of course, there's a whole range of reasons for that. But I think that we do need to uh, carve out Africa as a as a as a case, at which at the moment is not like uh, like South Asia. We're using a much, much smaller, much smaller proportion of our groundwater resources for irrigation. And we could double or triple or even quadruple the amount used on average, and would still be far, far lower uh, per per area or per capita in terms of groundwater use than, for example, South Asia. Right. And, you know, this report mentioned that, uh, and another World Bank report mentioned that 800 million people in China uh, moved out of the, the lowest to poverty um, uh, sector and about uh, 415 million people in India have moved out of the uh, most acute poverty range. 
and uh, probably irrigation and food security and climate resilience had a big part to play in their being able to reduce their um, population uh, with the um, high poverty status. Uh, so I think um, it, this is a really important, you know, uh, irrigation, water, fertilizers, seeds, all of those things that go into food security, water security uh, are very important. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, there's no doubt that irrigation is one of the cornerstones of food security and the correlation between irrigated area and agricultural production is, is profound. Any farmer will tell you, particularly farmers in semi-arid areas or areas that are, are subject to, to climate swings, such as they are across much of Africa, will tell you that without irrigation, the risk is just so much higher. And uh, so, so there's no question that irrigation is, is linked very closely to food security. This was one of the, the ways in which in which South Asia, in which China, and indeed in which the United States and Europe were able to, to increase the, the, the food surplus produced by their agricultural land and, and diversify and grow economically. And very few people would argue that we need to see a, a, a large increase in irrigated agricultural area in, in, in Africa, no doubt about it. Right. And another one of the statistics in the multidimensional poverty index was that 84% of poor people live in rural areas. And so then I think, and, and their dependence on agriculture. And so groundwater, which is a sort of considered a decentralized water source could uh, readily help uh, to improve the situation in those rural areas? It, it really could. I mean, you know, conservatively, we estimate that rural people in Africa depend, 75% of those rural folks depend on groundwater for their domestic water supplies, uh, either through springs or boreholes or shallow wells or, 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 or another technology. And when we talk about irrigation, it's often only fairly small amounts that, that we need. You know, we're not necessarily only talking about high yielding wells. We can, we're talking about small volumes of water can make all the difference between a family garden or a, or a communal garden being resilient to a drought or, or them losing everything that they've planted. So uh, you, you're absolutely right. Groundwater is, an, is, a, is a real uh, cornerstone of 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 household resilience and 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 uh, poverty resilience in in rural Africa, and I think a lot of these farms in rural Africa, you know, they're very small; they're one to two hectares. And so, and I think you mentioned before that in some countries, people are just taking buckets of water uh, to those uh, crops to to uh, improve production. And so, a liter per second or half a liter per second could go a long ways to helping them. Uh, improve their food security. Yes, it does. Absolutely. We, uh, you know, say it, it, even small amounts can make a huge difference. And, you know, my, my colleagues who know more than I do about irrigation uh, talk rightly about farmer led irrigation. We, 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 we put the tools into the hands of farmers to decide what they need to irrigate, what technologies they need and what what volumes they need. And they know best. They're the local people. They they understand the crops and the climate the best. And the key thing is to is to enable them in a whole range of ways to to irrigate uh, for for them to lead the irrigation revolution that's needed. And I think the World Bank has a, a group that is uh, called the Farmer Led Irrigation uh, Group. So I think they're working directly with farmers. So I think um, uh, that is an important uh, point. So groundwater is greatly underutilized in sub-Saharan Africa. Is it because groundwater resources are much poorer in that region or uh, they're just uh, other factors? I mean, sometimes I read in some papers, they thought uh, that um, groundwater and basement aquifers in, in Africa were much uh, lower uh, than those in peninsular India or things like that. But uh, the B uh, British Geological Survey report that uh, Alan McDonald led indicated, I, I know 64,000 cubic kilometers of storage. That's difficult for people to grasp, but a cubic kilometer is similar to a million acre feet in the US. 
but um, but there seems to be a lot of water there, uh, and so maybe it's other factors that are inhibiting development. Well, I think you've really put your finger on it, Bridget, in that, you know, we groundwater folk, we like to think of the groundwater as the primary constraint on, on irrigation or, or, or use of water. And we talk about all of the other things that you need, for example, an electricity supply or transport or access to banking facilities or the rule of law or repair facilities or agricultural extension or a whole, you know, dozens of other uh, uh, other sectors, we tend to call those secondary factors. And you'll see secondary factors in the literature. And actually, it's really, those are the primary reasons why there are constraints still. Uh, and in, in, indeed, we, we've, we've seen in many areas, once the secondary factors can be overcome, once there is an electricity supply, once there are markets for agricultural produce, once there's a stable banking environment or a stable institutional environment for farmers, then the groundwater resources tend, not always, but the, the groundwater resources tend to be found uh, when they're needed. Uh, in terms of uh, this idea that Africa is particularly low yielding as a continent, you know, I've always had difficulty with that. You know, there's no fundamental geological difference between Africa on the whole and, and other continents. It, it's just like other continents, it has a an unimaginably vast and varied geological uh, environment and uh, you know higher yielding boreholes tend to be anomalies anyway so uh, because in many places in Africa we've only looked for low yielding community boreholes those tend to be the, the that's the data that we have uh, so you know, the example for me of, of South Africa, where, I, where I'm from, uh, shows, you know, this is a, a semi-arid country with hard rock, complicated hard rock, fractured aquifers, basement. And yet there are, there are several areas where there is very good irrigation potential and indeed a very strong irrigated agriculture industry, which, which is a big foreign exchange earner for, and, uh, and, and in many cases very successful. Right. The arguments that uh, we sometimes hear is that, uh, you know, the caution uh, that uh, we may overexploit the aquifers or it may not be sustainable or the dialogue about transboundary aquifers. I think uh, uh, the recent uh, World Bank report on the hidden wealth of nations uh, describes the typology of different aquifers in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, one of the analogies is uh, like an egg carton. So these are small basement aquifers that are sort of compartmentalized. And so there really isn't that much to over-exploit. So they, they're sort of self-regulating. And I think people forget about that sometimes too. So I think... Uh, these uh, unsustainable or transboundary issues may be overemphasized at the risk of not developing the resource at all. Well, th th that's a lovely metaphor and a great report from the World Bank. And, um, you know, you're absolutely right. There are places where overexploitation is a self-limiting problem. And but I just want to be totally clear here. No, you know, nobody's calling for for a, a sort of overexploitation over exploitation it, it, it is an immensely serious problem in in many parts of the world including in a few parts of of, of south africa and 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 i've done research on, on on some of those places but um but you're right the bigger problem the, the much bigger problem is is on how to catalyze or spark uh better utilization of groundwater and utilization of more groundwater and we are unfortunately, in many cases, stuck in this discourse of, of caution and shortage. And, uh, you know, we can't, we've got to be very careful on one side of the border in case we spark a transboundary war on the other side of the border, if we so much as drill one borehole. These are important perspectives, but my concern is that they are obscuring the, the real problems, which which are, are of, of uh, a lack of, of resources, lack of, of irrigation and, and lack of growth and, and lack of economic opportunity. And what I'll say as well is it's 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 almost impossible to imagine how we can have environmental sustainability in, in many African countries without economic growth and without people having options other than 
uh, exploitation of of natural of their immediate natural environment. So, you know, in a sense, I would say that that you know, looking to groundwater as as a as a as a as a route to better uh, irrigation to, to to better productivity is also a route to environmental sustainability. If that doesn't sound too too strange, and I think that by by pushing groundwater off the table and 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 saying that we shouldn't use it in case we use up too much of it that's a recipe for continued stagnation and for other kinds of environmental devastation which we see unfortunately all too often right so you you've worked in africa for many years um Jude, and I really liked your recent paper where you describe, give many examples of case studies in South Africa where they have developed the resources. And uh, so these are some of these are examples of where we would traditionally think that they were low yielding aquifers, but actually when they um, applied many uh, of these questionable secondary factors and and got beyond that, then they developed the resources and developed uh, the irrigation and the, and the crop production or the municipalities and, and things like that. Maybe you can describe some of these examples like the karst dolomites or other regions. Yes, sure. That's it's it's really interesting, and I'm I'm interested in South Africa uh, because of its uh, the, the 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 institutional and economic circumstances under which irrigated agriculture was 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 promoted and pushed. Now, uh, don't get me wrong; this was a, a, a deeply unsavory time back in the apartheid days, and uh, it, I'm I'm not for a moment saying that this is something to emulate but at the same time there was a concerted effort to remove the secondary barriers uh, that farmers had to irrigating uh, using both surface water and groundwater uh, and there are some very interesting examples one of which as you mentioned is the the, the dolomites that the, they're called the transvaal dolomites very ancient castified dolomites which for decades were considered a very poor aquifer because of course when you drill into dolomite unless you've got more sophisticated means of finding cast conduits, you, you come up with dry boreholes. And hydrogeologists were very wary of these uh, until the 60s and 70s when very cheap electricity and uh, there was um, government scientific support for borehole siting and many, many other ways in which agricultural productivity was underpinned and underwritten by the government uh, it was realized that these cast dolomites actually were a very good aquifer and, and uh, boreholes from them typically yield uh, up to 30 or 40 liters a second and of very high quality water. And they, they are, 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 are currently used uh, for extensive irrigation uh, of, in many cases, high value crops, which obviously provide employment and foreign exchange earnings, uh, as well as food security and local economic growth. And another interesting area is that the, around the, the town of Dendron, a small place in the middle of nowhere in, in the northern part of South Africa in, in basement, so in crystalline basement, which in, in term most uh, you know, normal analyses of basement would say, well, we've got very little water here. And uh, as you say, it's the egg box metaphor and we'll be lucky to get half a liter a second. And it so happens that the tectonic setting of this basement is such that yields of 20 or 30 liters a second are obtainable and there's a, a highly productive potato growing industry that's that's set up around the town of dendron as a result they're all irrigated by groundwater from crystalline basement and they've been through a really interesting uh journey if you like between you know in the early days of free for all and with as you'd expect, declining groundwater levels until the farmers got together, realizing that we we are having, you know, there's no point in us drawing these levels down to un, to to unsustainable uh, depths where we can't pump it anymore. And so, very interesting realization that this industry, because it was so valuable, uh, uh, sort of endogenous conservation efforts were made and interesting, innovative institutional mechanisms put in place to help reverse those groundwater declines and not too dissimilar from some of the 
experiences in the high plain aquifer, for example, in the United States, where the industry is simply too valuable to let the, the groundwater levels decline and lead to a tragedy of the commons. Right. Yeah, I think Kansas is is an example there and also Nebraska, you know, where the farmers come together and try to develop more sustainable practices. Um, I think you had another example of uh, a fractured quartzite, uh, you know, aquifer system that was developed. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I guess the acronym was D Dageos or something. <laughs> yes, that's right. That that was a, a really interesting project in the uh, the, the Cape Fold Mountains, which are are uh, interlayered quartzites and shales uh, along the edge of the Karoo Basin in South Africa, um, tectonically complex. Uh, but the, the quartzite layers form highly productive aquifers, very good quality water. The, the quartzite is very pure, so the, the water tends to have a very low conductivity and a low pH, and it's often confined by the, the shale layers. So drilling conditions are difficult. The quartzite is very hard, and uh, so drilling is not easy. You've often got to drill to substantial depth to access it and at which point it's often artesian or sub-artesian and you are also dealing with uh, the, the various management issues uh, around the, 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 the balancing the recharge with with discharge there are thermal water issues there's it's a, it's a fascinating hydrogeological environment and uh, there have been there's been a lot of work done on this so for example this Dagios project looking at delineating these resources and quantifying how much can be sustainably abstracted without harming uh, ecosystems in, in the area. And interestingly enough, the project uh, to some extent stalled because not because there was no groundwater, not because we couldn't overcome the technical and hydrogeological limitations, but there was concern uh, by local farmers that that this deep drilling would would damage their long term water resource prospects, and even though the the aquifers were were different, the the, the, the target aquifer was much deeper and and confined. Uh, nevertheless, this led to such complexity that the that the project was put on hold, and it just goes to illustrate that you know that the, the problems are often uh, around the the institutional and the management side of things. How do we how do we bring all stakeholders on board? How do we communicate well? How do we ensure that we're, we're, our abstractions are sustainable? Uh, and compared to that, a lot of the hydrogeological, the so-called technical problems are actually relatively simple to solve with, with, enough, uh, you know, with enough resources and, and expertise. I don't think we want to admit that uh, our part of the puzzle is, is the easy part. <laughs> Um, that's right no you're quite right <laughs> but uh, I, I visited uh, Cape Town uh, many years ago Rick Healy and I did a short course on groundwater recharge there and we met Julian Conrad who's uh, running a fairly large consulting firm now for hydrogeology and uh, he was working on the Sandfell region in uh, Southwest Cape and uh, Sandy Aquifer recharged from the mountains to the east and, and they monitored the groundwater levels. And as long as the groundwater levels remain stable, you know, everything is OK. But then if they start declining, then they evaluate uh, and maybe ratchet back on the pumping and stuff. So very nice example again growing potatoes and uh, tea, ro uh, rooibos tea, uh, and, yes. and big, uh, and employing thousands of people, which is uh, fantastic, you know. So if people look at Google Earth, they can see those irrigation circles. And, um, and then if they're managed appropriately and with the uh, experts, uh, then I think it's, it's feasible uh, to develop uh, these uh, resources. Um, so you have men mentioned a lot of the sec que questionable secondary parameters that can uh, uh, limit uh, groundwater development. And I guess if we compare Africa to India, where it has uh, gone gangbusters and maybe too much, uh, but uh, costs of pumps and uh, drilling expertise, uh, 
uh, and uh, then energy subsidies, many of these things differ uh, between uh, India and Africa. And maybe Africa may need some, Sub-Saharan Africa may need some incentives and some uh, things to alleviate some of those barriers uh, to create a, an environment for development. What are your uh, thoughts on that? You know, pumps and fertilizers, energy access and financing and things. Absolutely agree. Uh, many of these things are, are, are much more expensive in Africa than they are in South Asia for a whole range of reasons that we don't yet, we don't have a, have a great handle on. We know roughly what's, why these things are more expensive, but very little work has been done on so what are the constraints to cheaper drilling or cheaper pumps or cheaper spare parts or uh, cheaper expertise, uh, better data storage, uh, better information? And, you know, it's partly because we, we haven't yet, I think, got this. Uh, we haven't yet thrown our weight behind the need to expand irrigated agriculture from groundwater. We are still in this frame of mind that says we've got to be extremely cautious about any groundwater irrigation or any expansion of groundwater uh, because before we know it we could go the same way as South Asia and ha have a third of our aquifer blocks overexploited. Now the, the irrigation intensity or the groundwater withdrawal intensity in South Asia is is easily 10 times, 20 times what it is in, in, in Africa uh, with one or two very small exceptions. And so we could double, we could triple, we could quadruple uh, area irrigated by groundwater in Africa without getting anywhere near the, the problems in South Asia. On average, I, I'm not certainly not saying that this applies everywhere. Uh, what I will say as well, though, is that you know, I'm a huge fan of Tushar Shah's work. He wrote a book called Taming the Anarchy. Tushar Shah at the International Water Management Institute, and he pointed out that these farmer-led groundwater irrigation revolutions are fundamentally not something that any external body can can easily control. What what there's this idea that somehow there's a kind of global uh, collective of people of experts who can who can control exactly what development happens and and how and when, and actually our experience is that. We need to let farmers have access to the resources that they need. In the case of, 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 of India, it was it was cheaper pumps and, and cheaper electricity in some cases, cheaper fuel. And they, they will then uh, drive the revolution and it will be anarchic at first. There's no question of that. It will be difficult to control. And I think that's something we have to get our minds around as, as hydrogeologists, uh, which is that we actually have very limited control over this, and uh, we've got to accept that that it, it won't, it will never go according to how uh, how we think it might. And planning it is is, I, in my opinion, a little futile. Particularly planning for the environmental disbenefits before they're visible to anyone. You know, people have people are interested in their immediate problems, and it's only when you start to see declines in in water tables that that very innovative solutions start coming to the fore. And you know, I appreciate this is controversial, but it's nevertheless, I think we really need to be a little bit humble in the in the sort of international development and planning community and 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 genuinely let local people uh, have the resources that they need uh, in order to to do irrigation as they see best. And there will be a period of anarchy. But the rewards are potentially enormous in terms of growth, in terms of alleviation of, of poverty and suffering, and ultimately in terms of environmental environmental safety and security. You can't have environmental sustainability and safety coexisting with extreme human poverty, in, in my opinion. Right. And uh, that's a great uh, point, uh, Jude. And uh, one of the things in your uh, paper, you mentioned, you know, different phases of development, you know, the triggering phase, the growth phase and the maturation phase that we have seen in India or China and these other countries. Um, but uh, that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is just at the bottom, you know, it just is not developing. And so I think it was very nice to, to read uh, that description of 
how uh, these uh, regions have developed and uh, maybe what to anticipate, um, uh, you know, we would need to go through in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what uh, some people suggest is that, you know, Alan McDonald mentioned that about 40% of the aquifers in Sub-Saharan Africa are basement aquifers, and uh, that these are essentially self-regulating, uh, that uh, there is not enough uh, really to over-exploit and, and they recharge every uh, year or every couple of years. And uh, so um, uh, it's not in the hands of the people exploiting them. They're kind of self-regulating themselves by default. I mean, there's no no doubt about that. And, and Alan is completely right. There are, you know, in, in many of the lower yielding, shallower aquifers, whether it's crystalline basement or another geology, Yes, you, you know, once you've drawn the groundwater level down to the your, your pump intake, then then you can't draw it down any further and it becomes a, a problem. And that's then a time when that problem confronts you as a farmer and you've got to you've got to start thinking about how to how to maintain your your irrigation. And we see in places like like India and 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 in, in China and, and even in many parts of the United States, some very innovative solutions, uh, institutional as well as technical solutions, start coming to the fore when people are confronted by uh, groundwater overexploitation. Uh, you know, in my opinion, the danger is thinking that somehow this can be controlled before it happens, and uh, we don't see that empirically. And you're absolutely right. You, you know, we. There needs to be a triggering phase in terms of groundwater-based irrigation, and 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 even very small increases can make enormous differences. We're not we're not, you know, we're very very far from a situation like the Central Valley in California or uh, mainland India, where uh, that the irrigation density is such that there are very serious problems of groundwater overdraft. We don't see that across most of. Of, of Africa, and I think if we ever got to that stage, it would mean we'd we'd, we'd irrigated a, a lot of cropland, and we had boosted a, the economy enormously. And and uh, you know there would be some very significant trade offs involved there. Right. I think you know when you mention small shallow aquifers, which are prevalent in much of sub-Saharan Africa, these differ quite substantially from the the large scale aquifers like the Nubian aquifer in North Africa and stuff, where we've got huge storage or the Indo-Gangetic Basin, you know, huge alluvial kilometers thick. You know, we're just talking about you know 20, 30 meters uh, deep or even less, uh, and so. These are quite different systems. It sort of reminds me of uh, the levee system with flooding control. You know, if people build a levee and then they're not exposed to regular floods, then they kind of forget about it and then they build on the levee. And, uh, you know, so, but if the farmers experience uh, this depletion on a regular basis, then they will learn to work within the dynamics of their aquifer system. And uh, then that will sort of regulate it. Well, I mean, I, I like your flooding analogy, you know, as I don't need to tell you, Bridget, you know, episodic recharge in, in semi-arid Afri Africa is a, is a huge feature. And in other words, you'll have a steady decline, perhaps, of, of, of an aquifer over many years of normal rainfall. And it's only, let's say, in the ninth or tenth year, you'll have an abnormal rainfall year and, and recharge again. And so... We need longer records. We need better data for us to be able to, to look at those kinds of features. But the idea that a water budget is something we should we should be calculating just in one year um, is easy to see in, in many semi-arid regions. It's just not the case. It, it, we need longer time frames and we, we need better data. And it highlights the need for better data, no doubt about it. And uh, in terms of your uh, the factors that impact uh, irrigation, one of the things that you mentioned is energy, energy access. And uh, I think um, in this uh, multidimensional poverty index, they indicated that 80% of poor people who lack access to electricity live in sub-Saharan Africa. So energy access is a huge issue there. And uh, But maybe solar, solar energy and uh, renewable energy uh, you don't need a grid. Uh, maybe that is uh, helping, although I don't think it has 
taken off uh, uh, as much as we would like possibly, uh, but there really are attempts. I know the World Bank is trying to uh, switch uh, wells from diesel to solar in Tanzania and other countries and large projects in that area. So that might help with the energy access part of mm -hmm. it. Yes, I, I really hope so. There's some really exciting developments in, in solar energy. The prices are coming down for solar panels. There are better solar borehole pumps. Um, and and I, 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 for one, hope that there's a, a solar energy revolution and, and cheaper pumps become much more widely available. Uh, unfortunately, there's still this idea that we need somehow, again, this omniscient we, we need to limit the availability of solar pumps in case it has uh, impacts on groundwater levels. And uh, all I'll say to that is that we'd need a, a heck of a lot of solar pumps to make much of an impact on groundwater levels in most countries. But if we did, uh, it would mean that people were using that water to grow food. And and that's what we need. We That's really what we need. We need that economic boost. We need that 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 assistance. So, I'm all for it. You know, the, the, the rural Africa is enormous and the, the prospects for extending conventional electricity grids seem, seem uh, you know, seem problematic at the moment. And uh, with a bit of luck, decentralized clean power from solar panels will will uh, play a big part in that mix. Right. And another aspect that you mentioned is financing, you know, so there are these mi microfinancing groups and and also uh, cell phone technology that uh, allow farmers to access credit and stuff. So a lot of these things can be sort of transformational in, in irrigation expansion and uh, hopefully incremental each of them. But together, then, if we can bring a lot of these factors and manage them, then maybe we can advance irrigation applications. Agree totally, Bridget. I mean, it's astonishing to me how little research has been done on the multiplicity of these factors that prevent wider uptake of, of irrigation technology and the ways in which they interact with each other. As you said, you know, it's it's it, it, you know, if you've got a, a if you don't have access to to credit and you're not able to raise the two hundred US dollars for a pump, it might as well cost two million dollars for all. For, 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 for all the availability that you might have. You, you simply can't access it. And these things ramify into each other. So, uh, you know, your pump availability and cost, you've got to add that to all of the other bottlenecks. And, you know, agriculture is a precarious business at the best of times. And uh, with, with too many of these uh, non-linear bottlenecks, it's very easy to make it just simply unviable. And, and people then... Uh, are, are tempted to fall back on traditional rain-fed uh, uh, agriculture, which is very risky, but requires relatively little in terms of, of, of input. And, and, and But at the same time, arguably consigns people to very low rates of economic growth and, and, and much poorer chances of escaping from poverty. Um, you mentioned earlier that the upcoming International Association of Hydrogeologists meeting is going to be in uh, Cape Town in the, the near future, and uh, you've been talking with some of your colleagues about the upcoming meeting. I guess that's a very exciting time for them, and, and so it'll be interesting to see uh, the presentations and all of that sort of thing from the meeting. Any thoughts on that, or what are you learning about? Uh, yes, well I've had, I'm, and I'm really thrilled that the IAH Congress is going to be in Africa again. And uh, I was speaking a little earlier to the, the uh, Southern African Development Community Groundwater Management Institute, and also to the South African Water Research Commission, and they're gearing up to part participate in that. And I'm hoping for some really good conversations about groundwater management, groundwater utilization, better data for groundwater, a, 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 a higher profile for hydrogeologists. I mean, let's, you know, we learned all about day zero in Cape Town and uh, there were promises made at the time uh, about having auxiliary supplies from the, the, the fairly extensive aquifers in and around Cape Town. And it seems to me, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that those plans have been quietly shelved now and, and not as much as being is being done as, as could be done until, of course, the next time we have a we have a crisis. And 
let's not forget, as, as, as you mentioned, the British Geological Survey work on quantifying groundwater resources in Africa. This is by far the biggest resort, water resource in storage. And on average, its buffering potential is enormous and it can really act as a backup to to cities and 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 keep things running when when increasingly erratic surface water resources uh, uh, may, may temporarily fail us. Right, right. So I, I I recall that the South African Development Community they had a, a really nice database of groundwater level hydrographs and uh, Mark Cuthbert and others have uh, published papers on these hydrographs and so when you look at them you see you know ups and downs but mostly in response to wet and dry climate cycles and the evidence of the episodic recharge that you mentioned that we can't operate on an annual time scale in many of these semi-arid regions but need to consider a longer time frame and so I think you know sometimes I um use an analogy of a bank account when I'm talking about water groundwater resources and so how much you put in, how much you pull out. But if you just look at the balance, uh, which would be the water level hydrographs, if they are stable, uh, then maybe you're doing okay. And I think um, Julian Conrad, when he works with people in the Sandfeld region, you know, monitors the water level hydrographs and the water quality and uh, to ensure that uh, the resource is being managed sustainably. So data are very important. And I think the more data that we can get and IGRAC, the International Groundwater Resource uh, uh, group, you know, are compiling global data on that. And so I think that's uh, very important uh, to look at long term records, as you mentioned. Totally agree. I mean, it's astonishing that how how few long term groundwater records are actually available in, in, in many, many African countries, uh, even even South Africa, which has a relatively well resourced groundwater sector and and has a long running uh, groundwater level monitoring program. Uh, the, the 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 density of monitoring stations is 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 uh, is still lacking, and we only get a dim picture of what's really going on. And as I say before, you know there are there are folks, not the least yourself, who understand a lot more than I do about long term recharge. But we definitely do need to look at it over the longer term, and particularly as the climate changes, we know that that. Um, that it's episodic in in semi-arid areas and uh uh we don't understand enough about that yet and you know the old saying that you you can't manage what you what you don't measure uh, that holds true i'm afraid and we 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 need a, a ideally a radical improvement in data collection data interpretation and the the turning of that data into knowledge products that that are that are useful for decision makers. We need to make it accessible and available, and uh, there's a there's a great need for that. We 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 have far too little resource on that at the moment. And and you mentioned earlier, uh, Jude, about uh, our guest today is Jude Cobbing from Save the Children. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Day Zero in Cape Town where they were 100% reliant on six uh, large reservoirs and uh, um, the storage in the reservoirs was declining very rapidly and uh, they were approaching day zero. But uh, groundwater development in Cape Town was, al was almost zip. Um, but at that time, then they brought in a temporary desalination uh, project. And also, I know some people, uh, Julian Conrad and others, started to look at the uh, some of the aquifers there. The I think it was the Malsberg or something. Um, and then Tabor Mountain and Cape Flats and other aquifers. Uh, but yeah. as you say, psychology is, you know, if you get beyond the crisis, then you kind of forget about it until you are uh, faced with it again. So I think that's the classic case uh, because the temporary desal went away and, and you said maybe some of the groundwater development has been sort of shelved. So I think. Yes, I, you know, unfortunately, as we all know, as groundwater scientists, the problem with groundwater is you can't see it. It's a very difficult thing to sell or, or a difficult you know to, a thing to get very difficult thing to get people interested in because there's nothing as unglamorous as a borehole is there and and when you we really struggle uh, to give it a profile that it needs and to communicate the the, the resource that is there and uh, you know obviously when a crisis hits it's then usually too late to start planning 
drilling and boreholes and groundwater management. You've got to do that beforehand. And uh, there is some really interesting work being done. But, you know, nevertheless, I think it does need to be seen as a strategic resource and something that could be drawn on in, in another crisis. Heaven forbid there is another day zero crisis in Cape Town. But if there were, then uh, it would be really good to see a kind of uh, you know, a, a comprehensive groundwater plan as part of the, the the solution, as part of the insurance policy against that. And um, I, you know, I do believe as well we need to start to quantify these things economically. We need to say what day zero cost and what such a what what such an insurance program could 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 save us in terms of the resources in order to be able to to uh, uh, you know release some of those resources that would need to develop it. Right. And uh, I, I know you say, think may, a lot of people may think groundwater is not very glamorous. And I think uh, United <laughs> Nations had the term uh, groundwater making the invisible visible this uh, past year. And so I live in Austin, Texas, and we have the Edwards uh, Karst limestone aquifer, which is pretty dynamic. And uh, I think in the news media, because the city of San Antonio depends almost 100% reliant on groundwater, they talk about uh, the, bore, the water level data in J17. And so everybody almost knows what J17 is, you know, uh, that they monitor that all the time. And so it gives them an idea of how deep a drought is or whether they need to ratchet back irrigating their lawns like they're living in the uk or something like that <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, I i think we could all learn something from the state of texas there you know as you say it's the groundwater is is front and center in the news sometimes and um it should be in other places too because it's just as important and and you know if we want to keep it in mind then we do need to to, to do things like that and we need to get public understanding on board and people should know where their water comes from and what things they need to do to manage it. Right. And uh, when I introduced you earlier, Jude, I mentioned that you are in charge of integrated water resources management at uh, Save the Children. And uh, considering that, for example, Cape Town was 100% reliant on surface water, there's an opportunity there to manage surface water and groundwater conjunctively. And I think maybe there are some examples of that in South Africa with the Atlantis um, you know, that uh, program and, and other examples. And so I think we need move to move more towards that. And if you have surface water, that's great uh, because irrigating with surface water can recharge groundwater and uh, then use groundwater during extreme droughts or things like that. So this conjunctive management of surface water and groundwater, I think is extremely important. I think it's the only way to go. And, and you know, you mentioned Atlantis, the small town to the northwest of Cape Town, where there's a very, very innovative managed aquifer recharge scheme, which has been in operation for, for many years. And and that was revived in, in as day zero came closer. The Atlantis scheme had been falling into a bit of neglect and it was it was rapidly revived and is, is as far as I know, is working very well again. And so you, the expertise is there. Uh, there's there's a huge opportunity to conjunctively use surface water and groundwater. And all we're asking for as groundwater scientists, I suppose, is to have the water resource that, that we know about given the same level of importance or, or given the same kind of attention as as the surface water resources. I, I used to joke sometimes at the Department of Water Affairs in South Africa going to visit them, they'd have all these pictures of huge dams down their corridors as you walk down the corridors these great big concrete dams across the rivers in south africa and i'd say to them why are there no pictures of boreholes when more than half of all south africans rely on groundwater as a domestic resource where are your pictures of boreholes and <laughs> but i can see that's not nearly as glamorous as a dam I'm yeah, but I mean, maybe some pictures of uh, springs and stuff, you know, where the ground Sure, is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things that um, I should have known all along was, you know, considering currently the population of Africa, India and China, they're each about 1.4 billion people. Uh, but the difference is that, you know, China apparently, uh, supposedly peaked last year and it will be declining. And uh, India, you know, is not projected to increase a lot. But in contrast, uh, 
Um, Africa, the population is supposed to double by 2050 and increase much further by 2100. So that's going to amplify the issues that you have been describing, which is water security, food security, energy access, all of these things. So I think it really underscores the importance of using groundwater to help with economic development and, and uh, millennium development goals and things like that. I, I totally agree. You know, there are some, 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 some very sobering demographic figures uh, that that are that are real that are coming and and uh, we 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 know that things are going to look different in twenty years time thirty years time uh, in terms of uh, of both population numbers in Africa and also the the split between rural and urban populations. Groundwater is going to have a big role to play in food and and water security for both and. Uh, you know, the sooner we get started on understanding it better, on managing it better, on on thinking about, about the constraints to its use, and 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 also thinking about areas that are being over abstracted and what needs to be done for those, uh, the sooner we get started on that task, the easier it's going to be and the better it's going to be. And uh, because uh, there's no there's no doubt that uh, we 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 need to see some changes in the sector uh, over the next two or three decades. Well, I think we're all realizing that we need a portfolio of options uh, to create a more resilient future, uh, whether it's water and food security, climate resilience to extremes, droughts and floods. And so groundwater can play a huge role in that transformation in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I think your work uh, really highlights uh, that and, and trying to change the dialogue uh, around those issues. So, so I really appreciate your efforts and uh, commend you uh, in, in taking that stance and elucidating those concerns. Well, well, thank you, Bridget. It, it means a huge amount to me for you to say that. It really does, uh, particularly coming from you. Um, uh, thank you is all i can say and and i agree with you i think i think we do need to have a, a, a bigger conversation about all of these things and uh, we need to have it soon right right uh so thank you so much our guest today is uh, jude cobbing from save the children and um, groundwater hydrologist with lots of experience in africa and many other countries thank you so much for uh, talking with us today uh jude take care Thank you very much, Bridget, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you.